look excited. <laughs> Yeah, don't run too quick. Very good. Welcome. This is the Ways and Means Committee, 6 p.m. Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. Um, we will call the meeting to order and acknowledge that the press and the public have been duly notified of the meeting in accordance with the Freedom of Information Act. Nicole, do you mind doing a roll call to verify quorum? Councilmember Popson? Mm. Here. Councilmember Streetman? Here. Councilmember Moy? Here. Councilmember Ward? Here. Councilmember Buchanan? Here. Councilmember Bell? Here. Councilmember Smith? Here. Councilmember uh, Pounds? Here. Mayor Carroll? Here. Yeah. Thank you. We did not have uh, citizen comments for this meeting, so we will move into item four, the financial statements. Mm -hmm. Deb, Chairman, yes, sorry. Yeah, I have make a brief statement at this time. Please do. Uh, I just want to take a moment to um, tell y'all how happy I am to be sitting here tonight. <laughs> I'd be happy to be sitting anywhere. In but, you know, We're glad to have you here. After last weekend, fun at St. 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 Francis. Um, I'm just glad to be back, and uh, I want to thank everybody that reached out to me while I was in the hospital and either called or come back and see me or sent an email. So I just want to tell you I appreciate it. Very good. Well, to have you back. Glad to have you here in person. Very nice. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Um, let's need a motion and second for approval of meeting minutes from April 20th, 21. Do I hear a motion? Second. second. Thank you. Any comments, changes, discussion? Nicole? Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Bell? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Councilmember Popson? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Councilmember Ward? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. Mayor Carroll? Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Trying to do a mental thing. Item four financial statements. Debbie, you have these in your packet, and Ryan, I don't know if you do them online, but we uh, they're in the packet for um, for this meeting. So. All right, folks. So we are 83% through the city's fiscal year. We only have two months left. Um, but as y'all know, uh, there will be revenues or collections made in July and August that we will accrue back into June. Uh, expenditures also, you know, there could be some, we'll hold open accounts payable for a month or so to make sure we get all expenditures that are associated with the current fiscal year recorded in the current fiscal year. Uh, the results through April look good. We have very strong accommodations activity, which we'll talk about more in a minute. The forecast predicts above budget revenues and below budget expenses for most funds. Specifically on the general fund revenues, um, I did adjust the forecast for property taxes down a little bit. And, um, We'll just have to see how things go with delinquent collections that happened in the last few months of the fiscal year. You'll recall that this has this included um, some, uh, you know, uh, assumptions on collectability that we received from the county, and I think we might be just a slightly bit off when I look at what we re um, recorded for the last couple of months of last year and add that to our year-to-date activity. So I'm trying to be conservative here. And I came off the forecast on property taxes a little bit. Uh, but on the other hand, I went up on the forecast for business licenses and building permits because those have um, had a very strong March and April. Business licenses collected to date are 1.422 million compared to a budget of 1.012. And you'll recall that we conservatively budgeted business licenses because we felt like there could be some COVID 
um, impacts on those, they just recently renewed. So the renewal period revenues, the basis for the renewal amount included some periods of COVID impact. Um, but uh, you know, year to date numbers show that we were a little too conservative in that budget plus um, all the activity associated with the new hotel and um, contractors uh, associated with that project, I think drove up the business license number. Building permits, same thing. You know, we've all seen all the building activity going on throughout the island that drives building permits. It also drives business license. Uh, parking, you can see that we're forecasting again to be a little below budget on parking, and that's just due to um, the budget, including revenues from pay parking on Palm that did not happen. General fund expenditures, the forecast has not changed since last month, still predicting to be over budget in fire and public works related to salary issues. Um, the fire department overtime continues to be high. We have now three vacancies um, in the fire department that are being filled with overtime. And then on, pub, on the public work situation was that we just filled a, a vacant position earlier than the budget predicted. So that's what's driving that number in addition to some additional um, overtime. And the other issue in the public works department is that we are paying as an employee, the attendant at the Front Beach restrooms, whereas the budget assumed that would be paid out of state A tax as a contract. If, if I may, I just, I think it's worth noting since we hear a lot about parking and parking related fees that all parking monies in this budget if I'm wrong, are from the city-owned parking lots, not from any state highways. And I'm guessing, Deb, that some portion of the miss on parking is because we actually opened up the city-owned parking for free at, at some point in time, acknowledging the impact that it's had on the business and trying to be as accommodative as we can. Hence, some of the miss from the parking revenues, which I think is completely warranted and justified. But I, I, I just want to, like I said, note publicly that those monies are because the city had the foresight some years ago to buy over five acres of parking to make available parking on the island, not South Carolina Department of Transportation roads. Yeah, and Randy, you're right. That revenue is kiosk, yeah. Front Beach, and the two lots. Right. Yeah. 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 In the budget, we had calculated for some in part. That's correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Next page. Um, just reviewing some of the April notes. Revenues are at 93% of the budget, and the, the forecast is that the city will end the year with revenues of 20.7 million, which is two and a half million ahead of budget, ahead of a very conservative budget. Uh, expenditures are 63% of budget and the forecast projects total expenditures at the end of the year right at 20 million. Two big projects that we've discussed before that are being deferred or not deferred, but not happening in FY21, but happening in FY22 or expenses related to drainage phase three, that's over 3.3 million and the replacement of the fire engine. The current forecast, including the changes I made this month on the revenue side, uh, predicts that the general fund will have excess revenues over expenses of 990,000 at year end. Again, um, in a couple of months, once the audit is, um, underway, we'll come back to you and, and uh, y'all will decide how that um, any overage in the general fund will be split. Uh, general fund expenses I talked about. 
$25.7 million in cash deposits. $5.9 of the total represents unspent bond proceeds and $8.3 million is restricted for tourism expenditures or beach preservation. Okay. I mentioned that accommodations have been very strong. This um, scheduled on municipal accommodations fee, you can see that. Um, we are 16% ahead of this time last year and 11% of this time in FY19 pre-COVID. So good news on the accommodations there. This is the 1% municipal accommodations fee and it is the beach preservation fee mirrors this activity. They're both collected by the county. Does that include the new hotel? Are we seeing that reflected? Yeah. So Sorry, go ahead. This would only include heads and beds through March of this year. So, so I yet. don't think it's been. When was it? Open? Has it opened? It opened, opened end of March. Yeah. And so it may right. have included a couple of days here and there, but not okay. a lot. State accommodations tax. We have received a third quarter payment from the state, and you can see that it is also um, running 10% ahead of. Um, this time last year and 10% ahead of FY19. The fourth quarter will be a big one in um, state aid tax. They don't exactly mirror the municipal collection. Um, some new news to um, tell y'all about related to the county A tax pass through. We did, after last month's meeting, um, I went and asked if there was any update from the county on the pass-through money, and they said that they expect to reinstate a pass-through of $508,000 for this fiscal year. No funds have been received, um, and we have not included that money in the forecast. So if it comes through, the forecast will increase. The county also advises they have included $385,000 in their budget for FY22. But um, they also said that disbursements will be based on 20% of actual collections on the island farms. So if our trends are holding true, then there will be, the amount will be greater than 385. So, that's okay. I thought y'all be more excited. Yes, sir. <laughs> you go first. Yeah, and that is great news. Um, it, it talk about a conservative budget for 22 at 385,000. That's way, way, way low, but that's okay. Just to have it back in is mm -hmm. positive. So. Uh, they, the email I received also mentioned that the county is interested in a contract that would lay out the 20% arrangement. So I, I see that as good news too. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that um, there's always the contract will include a, a provision that they can, um, you know, reduce that if in, in an emergency. But you know, we've never had a, a, a real contract contractual relationship with them associated with that twenty percent. It's just been kind of a handshake deal. So I think a, so, a formal so, contract so, would be a good thing. So, so related to the money that we hope to get, expect to get, that that's subject to a a vote at this point right so while you don't i mean they have it has to go through county council, county county council. council. Mm -hmm. yeah so the difference in a contract theoretically it wouldn't be subject to a vote it would be based on an accounting transaction and not subject to the changes on council correct um we haven't I, I, seen I, the contract yeah I, I, I mean that's that's pretty significant it is i totally agree yeah. okay yeah. thank you but to Debbie's point, I think, um, you know, we've all learned something out of COVID. You're going to put language in there that's going to let you have an out yeah. if you need to, for sure. Hopefully Susan. we never have that again. Not in this yeah. lifetime. So, so to backtrack and clarify, they're giving us 20% of the ATAX money they collect from Isla Palms. That has historically been. That's what they've historically done mm -hmm. and they are intending, hopefully, to do in the future, but in a more um, promised way. Mm -hmm. um, and the other 80% goes, what do they do with that? Do, do they, where does that go? Well, 
to the revenue. To the county. The county is accommodations. Is, is, yeah, just there's a general a county accommodations fund, but it just like we do. By state law, they'd have to, you know, kind of account for it the way we account for ours in a separate yeah. fund. So they're used, spending to be used for tourism related tourism related expenses. Mm -hmm. And, but they're getting that. They're, are they generally giving twenty percent to all the municipalities back? Is that or is it just us that we get twenty percent? No, I, I, I don't think it's just us. I think it's everybody. Okay. I'm sorry, Debbie. I couldn't hear what you just said. I don't think it is just the Isle of Palms. I think that that same relationship is right. shared by other okay. municipalities within the county that generate accommodations tax. When they pulled it. Due to COVID, they did the same with every municipality, not just all of them. Oh, gotcha. I'd be curious to know how they're how they're using that money. Personally. Well, they're bound by the same um, statutory requirements that we are for the use of accommodations revenues. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. So, Debbie, is it your sense of this communication here that they will take this up in Charleston County Council soon to talk about? the 21 disbursement and what we may do for 22? Uh, I would assume so, yes. Okay. So we yeah. just stay tuned. Yeah. So far, it's a conversation with Debbie and their representative, but yeah, you know, to Randy's point, there'll need to be some official action on their part to it's a vote. solidify. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's going in the right direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, hospitality tax, uh, strong April, but still not back to pre-COVID levels. Um, we've kind of talked about this internally, wondering why hospitality has not recovered um, as, as well or as quickly as accommodations. And it's, it's just a different animal altogether, of course. And you know, the Morgan Creek Grills, that restaurant's closed. So those revenues, that was a, a big taxpayer. And, um, that those funds aren't coming. And then while Dunes being closed for the amount of time they were, I think, um, has really impacted hospitality. Skip over beach preservation fee, um, local option sales tax. Again, performing strongly compared to FY20 and FY19, so 14% ahead of the same time period in pre-COVID FY19. Moving on to the project worksheet for drainage phase three. The, this is a one pager because I'm uh, accumulating all the Thomas and Hutton engineering invoices, the monthly invoices into just a year to date FY21 line. And also since this schedule was prepared, we have um, paid two Gulf Stream invoices, which that's the, the contractor associated with the construction of the internal drainage projects. And, um, the two payments together total $333,000. So half of the contract has, has been spent. Next is marina dock replacement and bulkhead recoding. You can see that the contracts and change orders received include everything down to change order number seven, which was the fuel hut. And then on page two, you can see the amounts remaining on the contracts. Moving on to the public safety building repair. Uh, mm -hmm. The bulkhead recoding. Mm -hmm. Are you really comfortable with this at low tides and get down below the down along the rocks and stuff? I'll have to. Yeah, I don't want to do a 
um, wait for the update. Yeah, like if or, we're gonna have a marina update okay. shortly. Maybe we can have. I just look at those numbers. And I'm always kind of here. <laughs> yeah, we can get an update on that. Sorry, um, go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, moving on to public safety building repair. Um, last month. One of y'all requested Kevin. an update. Kevin. Mm -hmm. Kevin. And so this is that schedule. And it's it again has good news. Uh, you can see on the um, page one, the Trident change order credits, the unspent contingency and some material savings reductions. So you can see those amounts in the pink box on page one. And then on the final page, you can see the city's unspent contingency of 618. So the total um, of the unused contingencies, both the city's piece and um, the contractor's piece and the material savings add up to 881,000. And I am taking out of that contingency number, the training room furniture and the parking lot gate repair that um, have not yet been invoiced. Great, thank you. Yep, super. And I believe that's all I have. This okay. to talk about. A few questions on financial reports. The last page you have in there is. I wanna, um, sorry. I'm sorry, but if I sure. if I may just give you an all, an update on the small but high impact drainage projects. Remember, there were five locations. One of them was 41st Avenue. And that project actually um, is composed of three different components. There's one component that's left. Um, the contractor was getting ready to start the construction of that last week. Um, and the work would require some road closures for two weeks. So Douglas and I had a meeting with the contractor and the engineers and um, requested that that project would be delayed after the season because of the just potential impact of, of closing a section of 41st Avenue in the in the season and um, looking at alternative options to divert traffic. Um, the option for um, doing it off season is they can use Wildwood as um, a detour route rather than 42nd Avenue. So we're just working through some details and felt like it was necessary to um, delay that just that portion until after the summer. So having a bird's eye view of 41st living there. My only question on that is, so we would have the road closure potentially around the time the restaurant is open? No, it would be, it would be after Labor Day, right after Labor Day. So I think this, the schedule that we have is the following Monday um, yeah. for two weeks. And yeah, I mean, two weeks is two weeks, assuming mm -hmm. The time's accurate, but but I I just I'm just thinking in terms of mm -hmm. you know right now it's 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 largely boating down there versus we, we're going to have restaurant traffic we potentially will have something open for the restaurant and um, just just for what it's worth I'd have the road closure while there's nothing operating at the restaurant just to get us less impact overall but yeah. some something to think about yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I hope if we get the first two weeks in September that yeah. we'll be in front of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Last page you have in your financial report is um, legal expenses summary from May of 2020 to April of 21. Randy, you had asked for a summary uh, by topic, I guess, for lack of a better term. So let me just highlight a couple of items for you real quick to bring some context to it. You know, there's probably, I guess, five one-time items, if you will. When you think about the bonds that we did this prior year, so that was $15,000. The marker 116 lease, that was for the new restaurant, 20,700. COVID, one time's a debate there, but hopefully <laughs> to be gone at some point. Uh, illegal tree removal, 9,200. Morgan Creek Grill, 5,500. So there's you know, a decent amount that is one time event driven specifics. Um, so you can see the rest by topic and uh, by category. So questions or comments if you've had time to digest or at least review it? I, I just just a quick comment. Yeah. I mean, some of these had a commensurate recovery of funds 
you, you know, if you look at Morgan Creek Grill and the legal issues there, while we had expense, we also had recovery of funds on, on the early lease. Um, I think everyone should understand when you look at these significant items, they do come with risk on spend, but they do come with recovery on adjudication as well. So I just think it's important that we keep in front of the public, where are we spending this money? Why are we spending this money? And hence ask for the details so that we have a fully informed public on what we're doing. Yeah. And, and given our 10 months so far, you know, we'll, we'll keep this active just yeah. as we keep walking forward because uh, some of these aren't closed obviously from a um, legal action standpoint. So we'll keep this in front of you just from an informational flow standpoint. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Debbie, for putting that together. Mm -hmm. Final questions on financial reports. Good. So move into old business discussion and consideration of fiscal year 22 draft budget. There have been no changes since our last Ways and Means meeting. So right now, Mr. Mayor, we are scheduled for a public hearing and a second reading next week, um, unless there are forever hold your peace changes and comments tonight on the fiscal 22 budget. <laughs> So good, good work and good team effort on everybody's part for that one. So we'll have more on that next week. Um, item B is update on Marina Dock Rehabilitation Project. We've got some of our contractors here to give us an update. Desiree, you want to sure. set the stage for us? Absolutely. You do? You had your chance. One question. Yeah, he's gone. Um, so as you all know, there's been some activity at the marina lately. We um, finally had uh, started the demolition process for a section of the docks. We've seen some of that progress happening right now. Um, I felt like it was timely to get a comprehensive update from, from the contractor about what we're expecting for the next several months um, and have an opportunity to have a conversation with you all, answer any questions. I like doing this sporadically just to um, you know, keep the conversation going and address any questions or concerns that they, that we may have. Um, the project's running well. I'm really happy about it. Um, really glad how uh, well it went, the, the demolition of the face dock and the restaurant dock, and we should start seeing some um, installation of new docks starting next Monday. So that'll be exciting. And um, Kirby has a presentation um, for you all. Um, we'll talk about the schedule, and we will also share with you some pictures of the new docks. They look amazing. So, Kirby? Kirby, why don't you use this? Oh, yeah. I don't know if it's going to reach the Kirby. That's all the slack. Go ahead and turn on. Find nothing. There you go. Is the, you have the, there it is. This thing off. <laughs> So I worked with Jack Harrelson of Salmon Stretching, uh, who's here tonight with us uh, as well, to develop a, a very brief presentation, just to uh, give you an update of what's going on. Desiree did a good job. You've seen the demolition. If you've been down to the marina, the restaurant face dock are gone, which is great. That went well. And I've got a, a few pictures, and we can talk through that and schedule moving forward and maybe just have a conversation answer any questions you might have. But very short presentation. Is there a clicker? There you go. Uh, you saw, uh, I know Kevin and I were talking about the barge out there, cut up the uh, restaurant face docks on Morgan Creek. Um, what they did is they vibrated the concrete piles out a, a little bit and picked them up with a crane, laid them onto the, laid them onto the barge. You can see them all laid out in a very nice fashion here. All the piles came out. I think they all came out smoothly, came out. Jack, a lot better than we had even hoped. Um, like like butter, we, <laughs> we said that they came out, they came out great, none were broken off, which is a fear we have with concrete pile extraction. Um, they all came out great. So we're we're in really good shape there. The docks, I think you can pull on them and fall apart. <laughs> they, they came apart really easily. And Sims did a great job taking those apart carefully, stacking them on the barge so they could take them over to the, their yard in North Charleston, offload them off the barge, and all that material is going to a landfill to be disposed of properly. It's just not salvageable um, material. So all that's, all that's been taken off to the landfill, uh, which is good. So that's everything west of the boat ramp is, is gone. Kind of looks a little strange. Mm -hmm. Some of the 
all the new docks for that area are in Charleston at Salmon's Yard, and they've been not fully assembled, but they've been assembled in sections. And what they'll do is they'll stack those sections on their barge along with the steel pipe piles that will be used to anchor them in place and set sail over here on, for Monday. So this is, a, this is a picture of the aluminum framing. This is actually a dock that's upside down. See the UK decking under here? The docks arrived from Canada in this condition. The plastic poly tub floats that have encapsulated polystyrene are shipped from a supplier in the Midwest US, I believe. And they come here separately on a truck. Salmon's puts the floats in a very specific configuration under each dock sections to take into account the different loading of the docks where a gangway may come down, where a larger power pedestal may be, things like that. So there's different floats, different sizes and different areas. They work very closely with Structure Marine to install those floats in the proper locations uh, as the docks are, are there upside down. In addition to that, you can see some of the floats as they've been installed. Salmon's has worked with their subcontractor, specifically the utility subcontractor for fire suppression, Groundhog Utilities, to install the pre install sections of the HDPE um, fire stand pipeline in the docks. Just a lot easier to do it on land than it is crawling up underneath there once they're in the water. So that pre installation is going to make the final connection and installation of. The utilities, they're doing that in the water lines a lot faster and easier when they get them here uh, in the water at the marina. Thank you. Um, you mentioned polystyrene, which is, if it gets into the environment, is horrible. It's terrible. Um, tell me that's <laughs> not going to happen. So your regulatory permit from the Corps of Engineers specifically requires you to provide full encapsulation for, for your polystyrene. These poly tub floats are high density polyethylene. It's the same stuff kayaks are made out of. They're 100% filled with polystyrene and 100% sealed. In addition to that, we have specified a thicker than normal wall thickness on those floats to resist any kind of impact or things like that or degradation from UV. So there will never, ever, unless someone sticks a, a gaff through there, any polystyrene that will leak out of these floats as long as we're alive. Awesome, thank you. Sure. That's a, that's a key environmental consideration. We're very keen to, and so are the agencies. So these, these floats exceed the regulatory requirements. So that's great. That's good. So all the floats for dock area C, which is the restaurant to face dock, they've all been, um, in, all the floats have been installed. There's little shims and things like that to get the floats in there. They're all ready to go. Salmon's is, is in the process of preparing that barge to receive those floats. And as I mentioned, sail over here on, on Monday. This is a not the best picture. And Jack had a, a lot of great pictures, but lost his phone. It still looks way better. <laughs> so I, I had a few, but this is a picture of, the, of a finger pier that'll go out towards the, the waterway. Beautiful EPA decking. It fits right into a notch in the sides of the uh, aluminum frame dock and is then is fastened down to the aluminum with stainless steel screws to keep it in place. It's a really, really beautiful dock system. It's going to get installed very, very quickly. Not fast, it's just it goes together pretty easily once you get it in place. So you're going to see docks that look like this here next week, which is going to be fabulous. They were still grass time too, and a year they're going to be much lighter in color. Exactly, Mr. Mayor. Just like the deck you have here on the front of City Hall, that's what they're going to look like in six months or a year. And then when it rains, you'll see that kind of that deep dark brown come back out, which is, is nice. But it'll it'll silver over time. Yes. Is, is there any type of permanent rail on those, or is it all is it baffle rub, or do you have any, or is it basically all the rail? There, there's a rub rail. Ron, can you go back one slide, please? I don't know if you can see it. Picture. Yeah. Barely see it. This gray uh, PVC polygon. Okay. Yeah. On both sides. And, and we specify gray because sometimes the black, black looks great, but it'll mar the side mm -hmm. of the boat. 
the white, it looks great when it's new, but then it gets all kind of ratty and dirty. The gray kind of looks pretty good. Can't see the dirt and it doesn't mar the boats. So I, I think it looks pretty sharp, but that's in all areas where boats may bump up against the docks and all slips, you'll have that gray PVC bumper strip. Hey, hey, Kirby, I just want to call it to look smarter than we actually are. I'm guessing, had we postponed this, given the rising construction cost, <laughs> That trying to do and, and Kevin might be the best person for this. Trying to do this project now versus how long ago, Desiree? Did we start this? Year and a half, probably. Yeah, ago. eighteen years ago. <laughs> well, same, yeah, it seems like eighteen years ago. That, that, that the cost at this point, if we were to pick it up for now, would have just completely gone us away. So I think we did so, this project in July. July of twenty of, of last year. Twenty. We, we bid another project, St. John Job Harbor, over on Johns Island. Um, in November, yeah. and the prices were probably 30% higher yeah. mm -hmm. for piling timber docks and things like that. It was just, yeah. I just wanted to steel. take credit for things that we had no control over. You did good. Steel prices have gone up 38 to 40% since wow. last September. Wow. Likewise, go to Lowe's and try to buy some treated wood. Yeah. It's gone crazy. Yeah. So, Great hindsight. Yeah. And good timing. Yeah. This this is the last project that we saw, and we've been projects out up and down the East Coast that has come in at pricing that was within expectations. Everything else is yeah. just over the moon, which is not, not, not great for marine construction, but we're on a path. So yeah. all these docks, docks are all in Salmon's yard. They'll all be shipped over here Monday. All the anchor piles for those docks will be shipped over here Monday. They're going to, Salmon's is going to survey those docks into place, pin them into place at the piles. They'll be ready to go. We're going to have to utilize the existing gangway over there to, for the utility contractors to get down there and start installing the power pedestals and things like that because we've had some impacts with the gangway supplier on this project not being up to full production capacity at their plant. They're behind, they're not at full capacity. They usually run two or three shifts. They're running one shift with half staff. And it's affecting more than just this project. So those are some of the little things we're having to deal with. So the gangways won't be here right away. They'll be here sometime in June, later June, but we've got a way to continue utility work out there as we're waiting for those gangways. So all those docks are here, we're waiting on the gangways, all the utility um, equipment is here, stored materials, some of it's at Salmon, some of it's at the, um, at the electrical uh, companies, electrical, in electrical contractors yard. Uh, but it's all, it's all here, it's just provided in place. So they're ready to go. Um, they're, they've done all the upland preparatory work, which you may have seen the, uh, transformer pad and all the trenching out to the docks, everything's ready to go for the docks to be in place for them to come back in and, and install the utilities, which is good. In addition to those docks, these docks, the charter dock or dock area B, what we call it, all those docks are also in Charleston and Salmon's Yard, ready to go. Now we have, we've been coordinating very closely with Brian Berrigan, the marina operator as to boat movements and how we can take certain portions of the marina out of commission to kind of keep him and his residents that are keeping the boats there in the marina. He's got a lot of upland storage he's also utilizing. So we're really playing a shell game with this, but what we're, we're gonna do, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide, Ron, is, is do dock area C first, which is the restaurant face dock. The demo has been done, which is the, the first uh, little bit of work. Uh, the mobilization reinstallation will happen next week. Jack's got two weeks in there. I think they'll get done sooner than that, just knowing these guys, they, they do good work. And then the utility installation will follow. The goal that we've set for that dock is to have everything complete and buttoned up for the July 4th week. So that everything's clean, all the utilities are hooked up, we're ready to go. There might be some little punch list items that we have to hit, but we want to button that dock up so even if there's some punch list items to complete, it's ready for public use that heavy traffic week. That's the goal. We think everything can, uh, everything's around to make that happen. So that's dock area C, that's restaurant face dock. Next slide, Ron. 
Dock area B is a charter dock. We had talked about and, and with Sammons and, and Brian and just Desiree and trying to trying to work the boat movements around within the marina so as not to displace anybody too significantly, maybe demolishing all of dock area C, which we've already done, and the charter dock at the same time. We just didn't have a, the space to put all the boats. I mean, we just couldn't kick all those people out of there. So Brian's got those docks really heavily utilized. And what's going to happen is Jack and, and his crew will come in, do dock area C starting next week. When they finish that up and that dock is ready to receive boats, Brian and those folks will shift the boats over to the new docks. And then we'll start the demolition process on dock area B, which will go all the way up to where the fuel dock is. Um, so that work will occur right after, you know, same type of process. Mobilize demo, haul all that stuff off to the landfill, come back with the new docks and piles, install that stuff. Once the new docks and piles are in, we'll install all the utilities. In addition to the floating dock work, we've also got a little fixed platform over there, fixed dock that goes out that the gangways will connect to. That work will occur with that as well. So that work will occur and we're looking at late July-ish um, into the beginning, of, uh, beginning of August to complete that work. We talked about after completing that work, rolling right into the fuel dock middle of August. Brian's like, uh, he's, he, we had already been working with him as he was planning temporary fuel measures out there. But the way that the demolition would really have to occur for the fuel dock and that little dock right along shore there is that's all going to go at one time. Because you saw how fast the, the docks came out behind face and, and behind the restaurant. I mean, Sammons is going to pull that stuff in two days. So we really couldn't stage or leave that leave him a little area over there to, to do temporary fueling. We worked through a number of alternatives with him, but what we had discussed with Brian and Desiree and Jack and just materials availability, which we're having some issues with the, the fuel dock materials, they're not here because we don't have the final engineering design plans because we had made those modifications or they requested those modifications to accommodate the, the fuel line. Uh, that's still kind of in process. So those docks haven't been manufactured in Canada yet. Still waiting on, on those. So with that in mind, with the season in mind, you know, mid-August, which is prime time, we didn't feel it was appropriate to take the fuel and, dock. And out peak out. storm season. Yeah, yeah. It, just, it would yeah. be really tough for everybody yeah. to make that happen. So we said, let's take a step back. Let's see what makes sense. Does it make sense for Brian to get out of the season everybody that relies on that dock in this community for boat fuel to be able to utilize that and then come back in right after Labor Day and the kids are back at school and traffic starts dying down. Then let Sammons come back in here, rip that thing out and, and put the new fuel dock in. And that's what we decided makes the most sense. And it seems to jive with the schedule that uh, the dock manufacturer up in Canada has provided us. So we could rush it, but I think we end up chasing our tails. And it would it would probably end up um, it would probably be more trouble this morning. Before we get too much further, going back to my original question about the seawall before you put that back in. Yes. Do you feel it's best to make sure that we've got the lowest tide possible, let it dry out as best possible to recoat it, or is it coated all the way where we're comfortable? So we had an inspection late middle of last week with Phillips Industrial, who's Salmon's subcontractor. I wasn't out of that inspection. Heath Hansel of our office was, who's been in charge of that aspect of the project. Um, I talked to Heath briefly after that inspection. There were no significant uh, lapses or areas that weren't uncoated. We have all the mill thickness reports to make sure they're putting on as much coating as they're being paid to put on there, and all those are, are coming in, coming back appropriately. So we feel pretty good about the coating. I know that uh, there were spot areas throughout the marina that Phillips was waiting on certain low tides to complete that work. Not having been in that inspection last Wednesday, I don't know if they finished that, Jack, you we, may know. We got most of it, Yeah, but there's a couple spots that 
we just didn't get low enough water to get. And, and the problem is, is you can see it, but it doesn't stay low long enough to clean it, get the, get the salt off of it with the proper, you know, preparation materials that you use, and then recoat it before the water comes up on it, which, which when that happens would, would degrade the coating. So you, you kind of get down as low as you can, the best you can, pick the lowest tides, do the best you can, and then sometimes you kind of just better just leave it. Let the let the growth get on it, let the marine growth and the oyster shells affix to it. That holds the coating on and actually does a better job, you know, retaining that coating than if you didn't get a, a, a real good coat, you know. And we're only talking about the last little bit right down at the bottom. Not like so. the problem like Corbin steel where it creates a rust on the outside that protects it forever. Yeah, and, and you're gonna you're gonna still see from time to time you'll go down there and like like painting your house, like anything else you do, you'll see a little bit of rust here and there in the joints of the sheeting and some of those places. It's kind of like cancer; you just can't get it off because it comes from the inside. But the contractor has been very diligent to address all those areas and even go back and recoat some of those areas. We've kind of gone through that process, and we think that uh, you know, checking it and, and checking the millage and going through the application processes and those kind of things, that he's got a, as thorough coating as possible. We've been, I feel good about it. We've been very pleased with the diligence yeah. of the coating contract. He's really, I think they really care about doing a good job here and making sure it's well done rather than rushing to get done. As Jack mentioned, they've gone back in several areas whether it be aesthetics that you noticed or areas where we noticed some rust, they went back and freely recoded those areas, treated those areas, treated the rust in those areas that we saw. It's not deleterious rust, it's just rust that kind of leaks out in between the sheets just to make it as good as a job as possible. So I, I, I think they're doing well. Now they're a good company. I remember them being on Mass yeah. Fair Road and Mount Pleasant starting out. So, <laughs> yeah, they've been around a long time. Yeah. So we'll, we'll provide all those final mill reports to the city as part of the project file, and just so that we can keep up. Thank you. Good question. Rusty. Yeah, thank you. Kirby, in regards to this last set of docks here uh, with Fuel Hut, that area there, so we're going to wait to after Labor Day, after things yeah. settle down, that sort of thing, and uh, and hopefully we have no storm this season to get in the way. Uh, will the will the demolition demolition of that set of docks and also the reinstallation of those docks will that go as quickly as the first two, or will that be delayed somewhat because of the fuel hut? From a from a dock perspective, it's uh -huh. going to go on very quickly. Right. From a utilities perspective, it's going to go slower because we have fuel, power, water, sewer, fire, fire protection, yeah. and the fuel hut on top of it. So the reconstruction of that particular dock area is going to go slower. That's what I was getting at. So what, I mean, what kind of timeline, or S, I, I'm not looking for a hard date, but just some sort of timeline when all of this is completed. Well, I mean, yeah. So middle of Okay, so I jumped the gun. Schedule together, which I'll provide to Desiree. Okay. Middle of November. So about two months to put that dock and piles, all the utilities in. And they're going to build a fuel hut on site because we Kirby, work. If you yeah. don't mind speaking mind? into it, yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak <up. laughs> um, They're going to build the fuel hut on site. We talked about having the fuel hut built on the floating dock platform at Salmon's Yard and then lifting that in the air, putting it on the barge or putting it in the water and floating it over. But the engineering with regard to picking that up, it's designed to float it, not have it suspend in the air. And it was a challenge. So they're going to build the hut over here once the dock's in place. The dock's going to be, it's really, it's going to be interesting. I'm, I'm really eager to watch it. Um, the dock has to be a little bit more buoyant to accommodate the weight of the hut. It's going to be the hut's going to be offset on that platform a little bit. So what Salmon's is going to have to do is ballast the dock to get it level to allow the, dock, the hut contractor to be able to build on a level playing field because otherwise it would be it would be tough. So that's that's going to take a little time just to get them going and get it right. It's a small building; it'll go quick once they get going. But that dock is going to take a little bit longer. Okay, thank you. So, <coughs> Thank you.
think that's it. That's where we are. Kevin. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I uh, spent a pretty good bit of time down there uh, Monday, Tuesday, and I met Frank, the project manager, great, great guy. And uh, it was clear right away that these guys know what they're doing. It was really impressive. And in my world, if a contractor says he's going to show up on May 10th, 99% of the time he shows up May 13th, two <laughs> days later. So by them getting there first thing Monday morning in two days, all those docks were gone. It, it was really impressive. So for one, I'm convinced we've got the right, right company doing the job. So very impressive. Very impressive. Thank you, Kevin. Just a couple of quick little questions. <laughs> the water depth. No tie down there. How, how are we looking? What part of the marina, sir? Really all along, probably. We're way back. So we got a good, pretty good amount of water in it. Kirby, for the and public, you better take the microphone there. Making my escape. No, that's a that's a great question. So it was interesting. Desiree and I had been talking about this and, and the potential need for dredging and things like that. And um, we, when we were working on this project, I think it was during the master planning process, mm -hmm. we got a bathymetric survey in 2016. So that bathymetric survey is five years old. So we're looking at that survey. That survey showed water depths of, you know, on, at the face dock, on the outside of the face dock, about 12 feet at low water, which is good. And it's pretty consistent across the creek, uh, which is one of the reasons the core let us go out a little bit farther. Um, and inside of there, it was eight or nine feet back in 2016. As we were starting to talk about dredging and the need to dredge, we did talk to Brian just to see anecdotally if he had any hot spots or shallow spots. And this was, it was last year when we were doing the design work. Um, he didn't report anything specifically, but I, I know we had talked about maybe getting a new okay. survey just to see where things are and ascertain the real need for dredging. And that's that um, the FY22 proposed budget that you'll be considering later um, next week includes funds for a new bathymetric study so that we can just have updated data before we move, move forward with any dredging. So that'll that's accounted for in the next budget cycle. Other questions, comments? Kirby, while we've got you, we won't vote to change the agenda. But our, one of our items, the first item in new business is uh, the disposal of the pile laying on the seafloor adjacent to uh, Dock C. Can you just describe that and we'll vote on it later if you don't mind? Yes, sir. Here. So there's a, um, I guess last year there was an impact wind, wave, vessel, we don't know, to the dock, the outer, I think it was the, the inside dock, the Correct. restaurant dock. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the piles failed. And the dock, part of the dock was damaged and torn off and subsequently disposed of. That pile fell over and is resting on the sea floor, um, the, the floor of Morgan Creek. We're not sure that it will impact the pile driving work that Salmons has to do, but in the case that it might or might impact future dredging, we asked Salmons to provide us a price to remove that pile. Um, Salmon's provided two prices. There's a, a lower price of 14,000 ish if the pile is snapped clean off at the mud line. So if it snapped off, the mud line is just laying there, and they just have to send some divers in to pick it up, put it on a bar to take it away, it's $14,000 or something like that. If the pile is cracked and just kind of resting like a tree broken off, but they have to cut it with underwater torches, it's a couple thousand dollars more. Similarly, if it's cracked all the way off and laying on the floor, but there's a stump sticking up a little bit and they have to torch that off the mud line, it's that same 17,230 price. So there's those two places. You don't know quite what it's gonna do. Backing up a little bit on dredging, two, two part <laughs> question. Um, dredging permits are a little hard to come by due to lack of spoils areas right now. Yes, Correct. sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And secondly, the city is not under lease obligation for the dredging, so I think you know, two things to keep in mind, because my understanding, anything dredged has to be carted off pretty much um, with, with the Army Corps of Engineers right now, um, assuming you got a permit. But I just want to clarify, bathymetric 
easy for you to say bathymetric study. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, that test thing um, is, is one thing. But the other piece of this, I think council and city needs to be aware of is we're not under lease obligation for dredging because that has the potential for being an incredibly expensive project. Right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kirby, that's a question yeah. as well on, on, oh, on the spoils area. I'm, I'm correct, right? This, this whole issue with dredging is a huge issue, not just for our marina, but, but across the board. It's very challenging. We're, we've just permitted dredging project at Ripley Inlet, Ripley Light Yacht Club and all that. And uh, they were previously authorized to use Citadel's disposal basin, which is nice because it's not a core controlled basin. The, we, we've done some other dredging projects up and down the waterway and the Corps of Engineers in South and North Carolina have become much more possessive of the private dredge spoil sites along the intracoastal that they hold permanent easements on. That's become a challenge uh, to either one, gain approval to utilize them or two, financially be able to utilize them when they're placing very onerous restrictions on the amount of material you are required to remove from that spoil site before you utilize the spoil site. So essentially you're paying for cleaning out space to put your stuff uh, before you place your stuff. And that's, that's very expensive. So it's a challenge that we're seeing um, up and down the Carolinas. Um, and we're working on overcome it. There's some, there's some alternatives to that that we're working through over at Ripley. Uh, and that, that could be evaluated here. Different alternative spoil sites may be available uh, on site, uh, drying or truck haul, things like that. Just alternative out of the box thinking uh, is, but it's going to be a challenge. Do I hear that you have to remove 125% of the material, put 100% in? That's what the core is requesting now, yes. Sir. Mm -hmm. Rusty? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Bill. Kirby, in, in regards to the, 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 the pile here, that we, we've talked about that before in real property. And I know this estimate here of $17,000 and change is considerably more than what you had initially thought it might be. Could you explain that a little bit? I know we're still with, within the available contingency in a good way, but this, I know we went from saying uh, maybe a couple of thousand dollars to 17,000. Yeah. It, it was a surprise to me, and, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that a dive, a three-man dive crew needs to be employed to get down there and hook up the pile, jet around the pile to get the leads around it. And Jack can explain that a little bit better because Salmons does not only the dive part in-house, they also do the, the, uh, the construction part in-house. So those are the quotes we got from them. It was a little higher than I expected, but that's, 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 what, that's what it came back. So we, so we really need to have the own dive inspection to really see what we were faced with yeah, in it's, regards it's, to that. It's really, it, it really anticipate all that happening at one time. So it's not like the dive crew is going to come and tell us what it is and then demobilize and Salmons will come do it. Salmons will be here with their crane barge ready to install the, the other docks. And while they're here, they can bring the divers over. They'll tell them what they're faced with and they can execute the work right then and there. Either, either if the pile is just laying there or if they need to do some other water type. Okay. There, you know, one of, the, one of the things to keep in mind is that- You may need to have a microphone so the right. public can hear. Okay. <clears throat> one of the things that Kirby asked us to do when we looked at this is we asked um, Brian and anybody that had knowledge as to did the pile, when it, when it was damaged, did it fall completely you know, flat out and did it sever itself and nobody could really tell us. Um, when we load up the dive gear to come, it, it's a whole different equipment package that we bring. It's hydraulics and things of that nature so that when we come down, if we just have to cut cables and reinforcing steel, you know, we use underwater torches, uh, broco rods, magnesium rods, those kind of things to burn all that loose. If there's a pile stump still sticking up, that could be dangerous in the future or interfere with other operations. Then we have underwater saws that we use to cut that off horizontal. So we end up bringing two different sets of tools, two different packages. Therefore, the price difference is it's a whole lot simpler and easier 
to be able to extract it, get it on the barge, take it back to our place and then dispose of it. If all we have to do is jet around it, if it's settled down in the sediment, just come in and jet around it, rig it, you know, hoist it, get it on the barge. And then when we get back to our place, we have to rehandle it again, cut it in half so that we can haul it to uh, somewhere that recycles concrete and then they actually break it up versus if we have to, to employ all the other cutting equipment to cut the stump and sever it and those kind of things. So that's why we, we prepared two ranges. One was a higher price, one was a little lower price. We just don't know what we're facing. Once we get there and the guys can take a look, then we can determine what needs to be done. But we just didn't have that information now. So. Appreciate the explanation. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Susan. And my question was just, this is, sounds like it's a must in terms of addressing the safety issue. And, and also, is this something that we might have avoided if we had been more proactive in keeping up with the docs or it was just, uh, yeah, we don't know what caused it, but okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. If I'm not mistaken, I think Desiree, correct me if I'm right or wrong, but there was a boat right next to it. Just moved the boat the night before and it fell over. So I mean, it was pretty close to having other dams besides just this falling it. Is that the same one? It might be a mayor, but we've had several sections of dock <laughs> collapse <laughs> in the past couple of years. So I don't know if that was that would be the right, but you so maybe. <laughs> or it may another, have been. Or another one. <laughs> Other questions, thoughts, Urban Jack? Thank you guys. It's my pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. See you we'll, Monday. <laughs> we'll vote on that item in a moment. So our last item under old business is discussion and consideration of implementation of paid parking in 2022. Just a little bit of conversation before we get to a motion um, on this one. You, you'll recall, uh, and I had asked to have this on the agenda, you recall last year we approved paid parking. Legislation was pending. COVID was happening. We certainly tabled it. We had it in our budget for fiscal 21. Uh, revenue numbers, 500-ish uh, thousand, if I remember right, somewhere in there. 200,000. I'm rounding, yeah. Um, in FY21. In 21. So we don't have anything in for 22. Um, you know, my intention in putting this on the agenda was to, it, it's going to take a while to get SCDOT approval. It's going to take a while for us to put a plan together to get SDOT approval to figure out where, how we delineate spaces, how we're going to kiosk it, or not kiosk it, but app it, if you will, from having people pay. So again, my intention was just to have a conversation around it tonight instruct staff if we so chose from a body to start the process, if you will. And at earliest, and we can at least get everything in place and decide when we want to have some conversation about implementation. So I'll stop there and just questions. Yep. Yeah, if, if I may, I mean, not that paid parking is topical these days, but, um, you know, I've had some conversation with Desiree around this. Obviously, had conversations with Secretary Hall around you know the overall plan, the overall intent. For for me, this this is starting a conversation. Um, we can say when, we can also say if, but to at least give city administration some counsel from council to work through the process of what looks like a good overall agreeable plan across the state, across the community for what we do going forward. This, this is not a discussion that says, let's vote because we're gonna implement plate parking on this date in 2022. I've obviously paid a lot of attention to the legislative sessions. It is interesting that the entire debate around S40 seemed to be what a good thing paid parking was for the barrier island communities and giving us the rights, giving us the rights to use monies in a different direction that we don't have today, that we are, uh, you know, everything tends to go to revenue, but we don't look at it as that expense line and what it's costing us in public safety personnel and uh, other issues related to, to beach visitation. So I, uh, I, I would encourage all of us to look at it and say, you know, a proactive council looks at the holistic issue of what we're dealing with and, um, you know, gives administration direction to proceed working with SEDOT. Susan. Yeah, thank you. And I think that one thing that doesn't get talked about enough in light of when we talk about paid parking is 
I believe with an app, there are several advantages, um, including the possibility of having a paid parking pass or seasonal pass that perhaps you could get easily through the app so that people who live in the area for a reasonable um, fee could have all access during the season without having to pay as they go and have it become something that is prevents them from fully coming to the beach as much as they really would like to. Um, much like the county park has a seasonal pass that's at a reasonable rate. So um, that's one thing that I think would make it makes it more uh, easier for people in the outside community to consider. Um, and then with that, if we had an app, another advantage is that we could then see how better gauge how full our parking is, especially on a busy day, so that people could look at that and by computer or by their phone, by an app and see what the possibility they have of getting the space is. Um, that's just one of the functionalities of the data that we'll have available to us. So, so there's some hidden advantages, I think that maybe people don't understand as well. And then just that it could help us provide a much better Palm Boulevard for all who come and use that space. Um, the, the potential for steering revenue towards upgrading it, I think is considerable. Yeah, and Susan, just real quick to that, and those are some of the things to work out, but there, we're in the process, you know, the beach reach app that the COG has. Uh, Ron has been working with software provide, uh, software folks on both sides to feed the beach reach app would be another spot eventually that's going to say full, empty, have parking, don't have parking, how many spots and such. So that would be a couple spots that could happen. John. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would... Um, I don't think we're, we're likely to vote on this um, in the very, very near future. Um, so maybe just a, a comment or a recommendation for staff and for um, whether it's this body or future council um, is to, you know, if we're considering paid parking, be very explicit about the goals, the, the purpose of, of doing so, and being very proactive in engaging both the SCDOT, which um, obviously we would be doing, as well as um, the broader community. Um, and if the goal is purely, we, we know that we incur, we, we on this body know that we incur significant costs related to maintaining that, that road, even though it's owned by the state and, and maintaining everything that comes along with parking um, from the public safety personnel to all of the trash to every, just the inordinate cost that, that we as a city, we bear. Um, the, the engagement with the broader community might find alternative sources of revenue that would lend itself to a more productive relationship with other communities. So I don't know what that looks like. I'm not prescribing the pathway, but I know that our city staff is very adept at bridging um, difficult divides as evidenced by how we've worked with the SEDOT in recent months. So that's my, my point number one. My point number two is related to S40. Um, and I don't know if, if I'm off, off too far off topic then just throw the hands up. But um, my, as it relates to paid parking in S40, my understanding of S40 is it's a huge limitation on local rule. And I know we've talked about as a body passing a resolution. Um, I believe that was kicked back to public safety. Um, as I understand it, S40 is now on the governor's desk. Um, and it's, we're, we're past time, I think, for, for us as a body to ex make it explicit to the governor um, if we are opposed, and, and I for one am, of anything that would restrict local rule, um, then uh, I think it's it's time for us to pass that resolution. Mayor, um, number one, John, that's a good point. It is on the governor's desk, and I think it's twenty five days before it makes the decision. But going back to your talk about local community, we had a meeting with SDDOT, Poly Beach, Evan Stowe, um, Sullivan's Island, Mount Pleasant, uh, James Island, uh, North Charleston. And uh, so we're all talking together and we're all trying to work together. You know, I think trying to do anything too quickly right now is, is premature. But I think, you know, if we all work together, try to make it easier for everybody to enjoy the beach, but in a very controlled and safe way. 
Mm -hmm. So we're working on, on going at the beach yeah. beach as was discussed at great length. And I think we're going in the right direction. Um, but with the S40, I guess I think we are only beach community in South Carolina who is opposed to it. Um, and I still oppose it. Um, <laughs> but again, it's it is on his desk, and if we need to do something, that means call a special council meeting to talk about that. Individual. Randy? Yeah, just some closure, and I, I might be a little closer to this issue. Uh, the governor has five days to sign it or not, or not. And those that have degrees in public administration can correct me, but I believe in 20 mm -hmm. days it becomes a law if the governor does not act on it. Right. So, to the mayor's comments on, you know, do we, do we want to send a message to the governor that would need to be within those five days? Right, which would predate the next council meeting. Otherwise, and, and, and my fear is, um, and I'll just say it publicly, if I'm the governor, I'm, I'm probably gonna let it ride, let it become law and not sign it, be in a position to state later, I did not sign this. For the balance of this, I asked Desiree, but we, we have worked on, city administration has worked on a draft resolution to be part of the city council meeting next week to, to take a vote on our position on S40. Um, nice job in, in, in the draft that will probably be in the city council packet, by, I'm guessing Desiree, by late Friday. Um, yes, the packets will be distributed on Friday, but I think that there's been some conversation by the mayor um, regarding uh, him calling for a special council meeting ahead of that so that city council can express their position on S40 yeah, before the within those I, five I, days. I so would, I think that that's yeah, what- And for what it's worth, I would wholeheartedly, knowing that, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but he has five days to sign it, but he does not, the governor does not have to sign this. Correct, it, he can take can no action. It can simply be an inaction that causes it to become law because it didn't get signed. And I, I think that's something, you know, if we have an intention of taking action as a council that we should take into consideration. Rusty? Yeah, uh, well, a couple of things here. I mean, we got on an S40 discussion here, and I know we're going to have more on that obviously coming up, but I too want to go on record that I oppose S40, so we'll be talking more about that, I'm sure. Uh, in regards to the paid parking and planning for that, I think it's a wise thing that we at least be looking ahead to see, you know, what may be available to us, you know, down the road in regards to offsetting some of the expenses of parking on Palm or wherever else on the island. And um, I mean, it's, you know, we, we see what gets generated on a typical high, you know, high traffic weekend in regards to the sides of the of Palm Boulevard, uh, you know, and the cleanup that's associated with it, the, uh, you know, the increased expenses we have right now with the mowing that needs to be done around the uh, parking stalls. Um, quite honestly, today I got tired of looking what was on, what Palm was looking like. So I got out with my 30 gallon, trash bag and uh my little pickup stick and i picked up a bag of trash including some diapers and other things that's been laying there for several days so uh, i'm not going to send a bill to the city I, I figure i can do that uh you know just uh because i'm proud of where we live and i'd like to see it stay clean but we do need to be looking ahead what our options are going into next year as to what we can do to not only uh, have the parking available for visitors to our island, but what we need to do to offset those expenses. Do we need a motion? At some point, I, mean, I want to just have some conversation around where people's heads were and kind of what was thinking, whether we make this broader from a community reach standpoint, look at other alternative sources of revenue. Again, to me, I think we need to give staff direction and it can be as broad as we want it to be. And it could be something, Council Member Moy, where you, you're, you're headed. I, I think that would be great. And I, I just feel the need to be proactive around this topic and at least start the process of a plan. And we can decide how and when to implement, whether it's an app, whether it's 2025, whatever it is. Uh, I just think we need to start putting a plan together and give our staff some direction to make that happen for administration. Ryan? Yeah. And, we're talking about starting the plan. I mean, we have. I mean, we, we've been. I think we're trying to continue the plan. Yeah. Better use of words. I've heard. What we've done, and what we've done, you know, Sheriff of Public Safety, we've met with SDDOT numerous times 
uh, to talk about this. They became a student body now, and they uh, became a student body now. I think you still need to continue with that, pull the information, the costs. We have them, we've done this, we've done this work before, <laughs> and continue to pull those costs, see what they are. Um, the costs are going to be larger now, especially with the, with the, the parking situation we have, and the maintenance that's going to take to keep it up, and see what those expenses are. And like I said, and just direct the staff to continue working with DOT. That's right. I think that's what we're going to do. Because even when they talk about that support, it gets sent to them. It has to, I mean, it's funny listening to the discussion, they're talking about it has to allow free parking, but there was no percentage or number right. or anything on that as well. So that had to be clarified. Uh, totally, uh, you're right, Ryan. I totally agree. Other comments, questions, thoughts? Take it. I'll make a motion to direct city administration to continue working proactively with SCDOT to advance um, the city's overall parking plan, inclusive of potential paid parking and uh, an agreeable solution that works for both our community and visitors to the island. Questions, comments? Council Member Moy, does that start at least a loose framework of kind of where your comments I think it's broad. I think it's broad enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to be is intentionally broad. Yeah. Susan. I mean, I just oh, think I'm it, sorry. It, John, go, oh, sorry. sorry. John, go ahead. Sorry. John, go ahead. No, I mean, the, the, my intent, I, I think it completes my intent, which is allowing city staff the latitude to say, you know what, if we engage with COG or surrounding communities and they say, you know what, we this is a service that we want to help participate in. And that is that is a revenue source that is at our disposal that might be an alternative to paid parking. It's it's you could consider it paid parking directed at a community at a, excuse me, at a, a body of government versus an individual. However, however we get there, what we're looking for is, hey, we're paying for a lot of stuff that is not providing benefits to our, our community. Let's let's find a solution that works for everyone who's, think, who's participating. I think in the that's benefits. a good point. Paid parking could take a much broader definition than what we've assigned it in the last year. Susan? Well, I think it's worth noting. I mean, we all know and recognize we've had huge population growth in the area but at the same time we've also had i'm um, just by looking around we have plenty more hotels and that are being squeezed into as well this is an opportunity for and not on the island outside of the island but all those people are coming to the beach um this is an opportunity for our out of town visitors to contribute to the upkeep and the infrastructure for parking that everybody is using. And like I said, if you provide a seasonal pass, then they will be contributing their fare. They are out of towners will be contributing a significant amount. So that's not something that I hear talked about as much either. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So Randy, can we make an amendment to your motion if we assign it back to public safety with that directive? Are, are you making that as a motion that I need to second? I think that could or, be a, or would you that like be a for friendly me to amendment? Can you make it a friendly amendment? We can do a friendly amendment. I'm fine with that. No final questions, comments, Nicole? No, sorry, take your time. Okay. Not gonna ask me to repeat that. I'm gonna say that like halfway through, and I just made a note to go back. <laughs> to, to, to repeat the motion? No, so you're not gonna ask me no. to repeat. Oh, gosh. What we're voting on now. No, fortunately, we have a recording. Hey, <laughs> Councilmember Hobson? Aye. Councilmember Streetman? Aye. Councilmember Moy? Aye. Councilmember Ward? Aye. Councilmember Buchanan? Aye. Councilmember Bell? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Mayor Carroll? Aye. Councilmember Pounds? Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Good conversation. Under new business, item A, we had Kirby and crew talk about this already, but consideration of proposal from Salmon's dredging for the removal and disposal <coughs> of pile laid on seafloor adjacent to Dock C in the amount of 17230 You recall we had two bids. This is the high bid, just 
to cover ourselves just in case. So I'll make that in form of a motion. I'll second it. Thank you. Questions, further discussion? I know nobody's happy with the amount. Um, so it kind of is what it is, unfortunately. Kevin? Yeah, but they're there. We might as well get it done. Might yeah. as well get it out of the way. What's kind of concerning is if there is a stump sticking up at low tide, now with the docks not being in there, people cutting the mm -hmm. sort of, you know, cutting, getting in the, uh, in the marina a little bit sooner. So it, it's got to be concerning if it's sitting up there. So they're here. Let's get to get it done. This is a not to exceed number. Just yeah. as you know, it could be lower, but you're approving the higher number. Other questions, comments? Nicole. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Popkin. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Item B, consideration of recommendation from the Public Safety Committee of purchase of a 2021 Ford Ranger in the amount not to exceed 35,000 for the fire inspector. And you can see where that money is coming from. So I will make that in the form of a motion. I'll second. Thank you. Questions, comments? This, yeah, just a, a comment. This is a truck that we have been we have been deferring, just trying to get more juice out of it, and, and it finally died down. So we just need to replace it for a fire marshal. He's been using a truck by the BSOs in the in the meantime. So it's he's it's eager. It, yeah, it's time. <laughs> we are replacing it with a um, smaller um, truck. He actually has preferred after using the BSO truck prefers that kind of a vehicle. So we'll be replacing it with a with a smaller with a smaller um, truck. So just yeah, that should be good. Any other questions, Nicole? Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Popkin. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. Councilmember Pound. Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Item C, consideration of recommendation from the Public Works Committee of, of award of a contract in the amount of 18850 to True Luck Construction, Inc. to install drainage infrastructure and grading to address drainage issue at the intersection of 34th and Hartnett Boulevard. And again, you can see where those funds are coming from. Do I hear a motion? Thank Second. you, Mayor. Thank you, Randy. Questions? This will really be our sixth small drainage project, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're using drainage contingency, uh, $70,000 that we've been budgeting. That number has increased for FY22. Moving forward, we, we want to be able to address some of these hotspot areas that are around the island um, proactively. We did issue an RFP, and this is a low bid that has been um, vetted by staff. Rusty. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, yeah, this this project really needs to be done. Also, there's a bus stop in that area there. Uh, it's gotten increasingly worse, I think, over the last few years too in that area. So, uh, I'm definitely in favor of it. You know, it'll help those neighbors in that in that area right there live a better quality life around the street there. Thanks, Kevin. I uh, just uh, uh, when when are they going to start? That was the you know. Uh, they need to be finished within 60 days of giving them a notice to proceed. So we don't know exactly when they'll start, but we know when they should be finished. What are you thinking, Kevin? Anything follow up? Or no, 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 just, just curious. curious. Yeah. Okay. Susan? Um, Sorry, just Mayor. to say that the, there was a group of vocal residents who were made a, made a great case for yeah. doing this. Mr. Mayor. First hand point is you and I walk down that street a lot. It needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I agree. Otherwise, I'm walking in people's yards. I must be shooting. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Bell. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. Councilmember Pounds. Aye. All in favor? Thank you. Our next two items, D and E. First one is consideration of proposals for marina parking lot improvements and approval and amount of not to exceed 15,000 for a restaurant lease. 50, 50, 50, sorry. And the consideration proposal for the 42nd Avenue beach access path. We need uh, some additional information on both of these projects. We're gonna defer both of these to a later date. Correct. Right. Our hope is that we have more information for council to, to um, 
consider a recommendation from staff next Tuesday, um, but we'll know more by the end of the week if, if we have the information that we that we need. Thank you. Miscellaneous business, our next meeting is 6 p.m. Tuesday, June 15th. Um, we have on the agenda tonight an executive session. So I'll make a motion in accordance with South Carolina Code Section 30-4-70A1 for discussion of personnel matters related to the city administrator. Upon returning to open session, the committee may take action on matters discussed in executive session. A second. Second. Thank you. you need a little yeah. okay. Councilmember Popson. Aye. Councilmember Streetman. Aye. Councilmember Moy. Aye. Councilmember Ward. Aye. Councilmember Buchanan. Aye. Councilmember Val. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Mayor Carroll. Aye. Councilmember Pound.